My name is Daniel. I'm here to talk about how Clojure works. And um, it's great to be here in San Francisco. It's great to be able to, to talk about Clojure with you guys. And I look forward to meeting you uh, throughout the conference and chatting and all that. So from Alex's uh, introduction, it seems like there's a lot of newbies to Clojure. Uh, so you may not have seen this program before, but those of us who have been around for a few years, how many people recognize this, what's on the screen here? So a few of you. This was a program created by Rich Hickey a few years back to demonstrate uh, Clojure's concurrency uh, support. And we can see it running. So I have here a Vim session connected to a REPL. So I can you know, kind of send commands. So I load the file, define my ants, start the animator, start the evaporator, and start the, the actual animation itself. So I mean, the purpose of this program is really to show the, the concurrency parameters in Clojure. But at the time, I was, you know, doing C++ and Java development. And so I knew this was a swing program. And something that just completely blew my mind at the time is like, say, I don't like black ants. Say, I want blue ants. So just type a little something in here, and bam, they're blue. You know, everything, you know the program is still running, but I can change the program as I run it. You know, what if I want to? say, change evaporation rate. You know, just see what you know, changing a little thing here and there can do. And wow, all that stuff went away. Um, you know, when you come from a background where you have to wait like a minute to be able to you know, recompile, redeploy, restart you know, your application, you know, seeing this instant feedback was mind blowing. Yeah, no more hair. It's all gone. <laughs> So how does Clojure support this? You know, how does it work? Well, it's magic. Well, you know, that can't be right. It's interpreted. I mean, that's your natural inclination. You know, it's not really compiled or anything. It's interpreted. But it's not true. It's compiled magic. And you know, at this point, you might be saying, come on, get serious. It's not magic. Well, if you ask this guy, he'll tell you that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I'm here to tell you that Clojure is just that good. But how, you know, what is this technology? What makes this work? You know, can anyone tell me? Any guesses? Mutable state. Mutable state. Yes, <laughs> it is. But in particular, it's VARs. And so, you know, what are VARs? If you've, you know, you use them all the time, but you maybe you haven't really thought about them in a lot of detail. They're originally created just as kind of creating a mutable cell that can have thread local values. And these values can either be the thread local value, if there is one, or if not, then it'll check for root binding. And if there's not, none of those, then it's just gonna be an unbound VAR. So if you were to start up a REPL session and you know, creating an, un an unbound var is pretty simple. You just def whatever. You get a var as a result. You can see that, yes, in fact, it is you know, closure.lang.var. And the hash quote syntax is just a shortcut for saying you know, var x. And as we can see, if we actually try to use a var, it's you know, undefined and unbound. So most of the time, you're not creating unbound vars. You know, you're, you're creating them with some sort of root binding. And we see that, yeah, this is uh, you know, still a var, but it has a value of x. And we can see that the type of the value is you know, an integer. So what about thread-bound vars? You know, we can define, again, an unbound var. And we try to, the way to give a thread bound or a thread local binding for a var is to use this binding uh, macro. 
And before Closure 1.3, this would have worked. Something changed in Closure 1.3. Now, to do thread local bindings, you have to explicitly opt into this. So we can add the dynamic tag, and now we can see that it has a thread local binding. Any guesses of why this change happened? Exactly. There's a difference in you know, when you have to get a thread local value versus getting just you know, the root value or the root binding of, of the var. So you know, here we have two programs that are more or less the same with the exception of adding this dynamic tag to the second var. And you know, if we try doing something like this on the REPL, we can see how Clojure behaves differently. You know, we can define this earmuffed var you know, to, you know, to be world, and Clojure will, will give you a warning and say, hey, you're using an earmuffed var, but you didn't mark it dynamic. And we're going to ignore that for now. So define a function that uses it. You know, we call the function. No problem. It's what we expect. But now we're going to do something tricky. We're going to redefine the var, reset its value, but this time it's going to be dynamic. So what's going to happen? We call hello. OK, that's what I expect. Nothing surprising there. Let's try it with a, a thread local value or a thread local binding. And if we do that, whoa. You know, what happened? We're not getting our thread local value. You know, what happened here? Is it broken? Well, we can try adding a println, you know, everyone's favorite debugging method. And we see with the println that you know, it, it works. There is a thread local binding to that var, but for whatever reason, the hello function isn't seeing that. If we just redefine the hello function the exact same way, we can see now that it, res you know, it responds to that thread local binding. So what's going on? At compile time, when you use a var, Clojure will see that and will actually compile different code depending on whether or not you're using a static or a dynamic var. A static var will call get raw root versus a dynamic binding or a dynamic var will call get. And if you were to look at the Clojure source code, you can see that the code for get raw root is exceedingly simple. You know, very straightforward. You just return you know, the root binding. But for var.get, it is a lot more complicated. You, know, you have to check to see, is there a thread local binding? And if so, you, know, you need to figure out you know, what it is and return it. Um, and this is essentially why that change was made. You know, there's a big difference at runtime between doing this and doing all this. So unsurprisingly, dynamic vars do have a big runtime cost, but static vars aren't exactly free. You know, for example, if we take this you know, simple hello world function and compile it, when we see the class, you know, how, do, how do we use that closure.core you know, str function? And since all, you know, the functions are compiled into, into classes, we can kind of decompile it and, and analyze what it is that Clojure is doing at the runtime. And so we see that there's a couple of things going on. Every time that this function is invoked, we have to get the root binding of that, that static var. And when we you know, first load up that function at all in Clojure, we have to look it up. So that means that we end up kind of caching the reference to the var, but not necessarily to its value. We, Clojure kind of assumes that it can change at any point, any time, and that's true when you're, when you're doing your dynamic development. You know, if, if it cached the actual you know, value of the var instead of uh, the var itself, you wouldn't be able to do any of this you know, dynamic development. So how does you know, Clojure get a reference to this? And we can see you know, in this static initializer, use rt.var which takes a couple of strings for a namespace and a name. And if we were to look at you know, enclosure.lang.rt and see what, you know, how that works, we see that there's a lot of interns involved. And 
well, you know, what does all this do? And essentially what, what all this code does is essentially creates a canonical reference to a particular var in the runtime. So we can experiment with this in the REPL. You know, we just make something up, foo bar, and you know, if we try to reference that var, get it, you know, get the var itself, it's gonna tell us, hey, that doesn't exist. If we try to dereference, it's gonna say, well, that namespace doesn't even exist. Well, what if we try to use rt.var just, you know, just for fun? And bam, we, we now have that var exists and we can, you know, it doesn't complain about it not existing anymore. And if you actually try to use it, you'll see that it's, it's given it by default an unbound value. So this not only created the var, it also created a namespace. So let's start talking about namespaces. So how, how is all this actually being managed? There's a namespace class that has uh, three, field, uh, three uh, fields of, of interest. Two of them are, you know, belong to a particular namespace or instance fields, and the other one is a, a static field. So the first one of these is mappings. And a mapping is just a mapping from a symbol to an object. But in, at the runtime, really, it's, it's gonna be one of two different types of mappings. It's either gonna be a symbol to a var or a symbol to a class. So we can you know, kind of play around with this idea. So let's create a namespace called namespaces. And now if we try to access you know, the namespace via the, the earmuffed namespace um, uh, var, we're gonna get an exception because right now, Clojure doesn't know how to look that up. We can use a fully qualified uh, reference and that will get a, give us the, the value of that namespaces. And we can actually look at the value of that mappings by using nsmap. And we see that there's all that stuff in there even though you know, we haven't really done anything. And the fact of the matter is, is that Clojure will by default put in a bunch of imports. So you can refer to you know, classes like string or boolean without having to do java.lang.string. So how do we add things into this map? The simplest way is to use def. It creates a mapping from a symbol to a, uh, to a var in the current namespace. So you know, def answer 42, we see now we have in namespaces answer var, we can dereference it, and we can actually see that it is in fact in our map. The second way is to refer to, to a different namespace. So this allows us to create local mappings, local symbols that refer to vars in some other namespace. So the way to do this, or the primitive for doing this, is using refer, so we can easily just refer closure core. And now we can actually use like nsmap and the earmuffed ns without having to specify closure core. And we can see that we can look up the NS in the, uh, uh, in the NS map, and it's there. The last way to do it is to import. And so this is a way of giving a kind of a, a local name to a Java class. And the way to do that is unsurprisingly the import function, which returns back a class. And we can see that in the mapping, if we look up that URL symbol, we get back that class. The second uh, field that's of interest in the namespace, aliases. So you know, how does aliases differ from mappings? Well, alias gives you a mapping from a symbol to a namespace. So it's kind of giving a local name to some other namespace. You can examine the aliases map by just saying NS aliases, and you can add aliases using the alias function. So it returns nil, but you can see that now in the aliases map, we have the, that mapping from s to closure.string, and it's not in the mappings because you know, it's an alias. And now when we use s on the namespace side of a symbol, um, Clojure knows how to look that up. So most of the time you're not actually using uh, like import and refer at, uh, you know, at, you don't use these primitives. You use the NS macro. And so like what we have here is that when you require closure.str, it adds a mapping of S in, 
to the closure.str namespace. And when you use closure REPL, that adds, you know, that refers to that closure REPL namespace into your current namespace. And the imports, you know, add that, that URL mapping. And the last bit of interest in this namespaces class is this namespaces static field. It is a mapping of symbols to namespaces, and it's essentially how Clojure keeps track of all the namespaces and all the vars that have been loaded into the runtime. There's no way to get access to that, that namespaces map directly, <clears throat> at least not through, through Clojure Core, but you can query it, you know, for example, using find ns, or you can get a sequence of all the loaded namespaces using all ns. So that tells us, OK, now we know where Clojure stores all the vars in the system. But you know, how do we actually put stuff into it? Well, let's take a simple program. We have a program that creates you know, a namespace, greeter hello, and there's a couple of vars in there. And when we compile this, it creates a, a class called you know, greeter.hello underscore underscore init. And the, the purpose of this class, it's, you know, every namespace has one of these if you're AOT compile. And the purpose of this class essentially is to bootstrap your namespace. So if we were to decompile it and kind of look at you know, what all it's doing, it looks something like this. It's a lot of code. You know, what is all that going on? I mean, it has to create the namespace, it has to refer to Clojure Core, it has to you know, create all the vars that you're using, you know, build the metadata, create all the root bindings, add the metadata. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. And I mean, you can see that, that this can have you know, an impact on your runtime. Uh, looking at Clojure 1.5.1 on its core init, I mean, there's there's over 2,000 of these class constants that have to be created, and a bunch of calls to you know, bind root, set meta, get raw root. Just starting a closure, you know, a basic closure REPL, I mean, not through line again or anything else like that, um, I mean, you see thousands of calls to get raw root, and you know, over 100, actually over 100,000 calls to get raw root, and thousands of calls to these other things. So, I mean, if you ask why um, closure startup time is so slow. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, it's the JVM. But it's not the JVM. It's this bootstrapping of closure core and any namespaces that you're using. Um, you know, just comparing like a, a, a Hello World program uh, that's just plain using Java versus you know, closure, we can, we can measure that that you know, there's 30 ta 35 times as much time being spent bootstrapping the runtime compared to actually you know, running the code that you're particularly interested in. You know, the second potential problem with this, with the way things are set up, is that every time that you invoke a function, you, you need to do this get raw root. Um, you know, and that's fine. It's what allows you to do this dynamic development, but a lot of time, a lot of the functions that you're using aren't being redefined. And like in a talk that I gave two years ago, in a particular tight loop, just getting raw root for two different vars added as much as 10% overhead in a particular uh, computation. There's also the question of heap use. Namespaces are atomic. You can't break them up. You can't just load up you know, the functions that you're going to use. And in my experimentation, I found that, that you know, Clojure uses about 17 megabytes of heap. I mean, if you're using a VM that's going to be running with gigabytes of, of heap, then you know, maybe you don't care. But in, uh, if you're looking at using Clojure in more embedded spaces, you know, running on Android or something like that, this, this can be an issue. Um, there was a feature addition to allied metadata, but I didn't find that this had a big impact on the, uh, on the actual runtime use of heap. And but I did kind of do some, some experimentation where I do some manual tree shaking. I go up and I comment out parts of Clojure Core and run it. And I found that you know, that did make a big impact. So, so we're going to get back to, to that point in a little bit. The other part is, is that 
that there's a lot of indirection involved in, in, in being able to execute a closure function. You have to get the var, you get, have to get the var's binding, and then finally you can invoke it through a generic uh, interface, which is great. You know, that, there's a lot of value in that, but it does mean that if you're trying to write a, an, you know, some sort of static analysis tool that looks at the compiled bytecode, um, you know, it's very hard to know what exactly uh, is going on. So, you know, what about tree shakers? I, I talked about this just a couple of minutes ago. There's, I'm, I'm saying that there's essentially two different types of tree shakers. There's tree shakers that can, can look at your closure code. So this could be built on top of, say, tools.analyzer. And, you know, it can kind of look at your closure code base, figure out what you're using, and kind of get rid of the, pitch, the parts that you're not using. And, you know, there's some advantages to this sort of approach. You could use it for closure, closure script, um, you know, closure CLR. But the, the main problem is that, you know, closure being a hosted language, oftentimes you're using features of the underlying platform. You're using Java libraries. You're using, um, you know, JavaScript li libraries. And, and a source level um, tree shaker isn't going to be able to look beyond that normal. You know. And also, I mean, one of these things doesn't exist yet, as far as I know, in Clojure. And uh, I mean, it'd be a great and fun project for someone to work on. An alternative approach is, well, let's not, let's not try to tree shake you know, the Clojure sources. Let's look at the compiled output and do the tree shaking based on that. And that's essentially what Clojure Script does through the you know, advanced compilation mode. And there are tools for the JVM that do this. You know, there's one you know, called ProGuard that does you know, kind of tree shaking and minification you know, much of the way that, that you, know, you could do with the closure script advanced uh, compiler mode. But um, because of the way there's all this indirection, uh, ProGuard does not work on this. If you try to run ProGuard on your program, you know, it'll run, but then when you actually try to use it, it'll just completely fail. Oh. Another approach is to be lazy. This is an approach that, uh, that has been used successfully in the Clojure Objective-C project. So instead of building up all these, these vars and at namespace initialization time, instead of doing it at startup, you just wait until you actually need to use it. And it was successfully used to make a significant impact on cutting down the startup time for you know, an Objective-C closure program on an iPhone or on a Mac. Uh, and the technique that's used here should be usable on the JVM. There's nothing Objective-C special about it. So what this would do is really help with the startup time. I mean, it doesn't really solve the problem, but it kind of amortizes it over the, the, the warm-up time for your particular application. And to the extent that it only loads up the things that you need to use, you know, it can reduce heap use. But it doesn't, for example, solve the, the, the overhead from get raw root. So the you know, third potential solution to this is to go static. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, no vars, no namespaces, you know, just raw speed. So how do we... You know, how do we accomplish that? Well, if we look at Hello World, you're probably getting tired of seeing this program. You know, what if we compile it to something that looks like this? Where we, we, we can take, uh, we compile uh, functions instead of to their own classes. Let's say we, you know, compile them directly into static fields in a class. And what this would be able to do is, is completely eliminate the overhead enclosure from startup. We wouldn't have to find our vars in the reference. Essentially, we can, we can take advantage of the underlying JVM linker to find all these things for us. And if we structure things appropriately, we can also make sure that it doesn't load things that we're not going to use. So, you know, this has a lot of benefits. I mean, it can make you know, closure bytecode that, that's a minimal static analysis. It can get rid of all the overhead of ours and namespaces because we're, we're completely getting rid of it. 
But there's a couple of big problems with this. Is it means that now we have a runtime that's completely incompatible with you know, the existing closure runtime, and also it doesn't exist. You know, no one's written this. Well, not yet anyway. There's, um, there's a few students out there that, uh, that, that have been looking into this pro problem. I'm hoping that we're going to have a Summer of Code student that's going to be working on this over the summer. So I'm, I'm really enthusiastic that we're going to see you know, some sort of lean runtime um, start getting worked on over the course of the year. So long term, I mean, the way I would like to see this, this project evolve is, you know, first, let's just start with a basic static runtime. And then little by little, add support of either like simulating or adding kind of the dynamic features. And once we can get a runtime that can be completely hybrid, have parts of it that are static, parts of it that are fully dynamic, then I would love to see this become you know, part of Clojure itself. So there's a, you know, since this is about the runtime, there's a few other kind of dynamic runtime features that I wanted to talk about. Um, most of the time, you know, with VARs, you don't really care what class is being uh, generated. But there are some features in Clojure that really de depend on having a specific class, uh, namely like def type, def record. And when you do this, you get a user.foo class. And, and so one of the problems in the JVM is, well, you know, if you want to rename you know, or redefine foo, how do you, how do you, you know, keep on being able to use the same class name? And the dynamic class loader in, in Clojure kind of allows this functionality. So we can, for example, create a couple instances of foo, and we can see that they're equivalent. If we were to redefine foo here, we could another user.foo class. It's the same name, but it's a different class. So if we create, you know, redefine Baz to be one of the new foos, we see that the two foos are no longer uh, equivalent. And that's because they have, you know, they are different classes, so you can't compare them directly. And we can see that, yes, they're both user.foo classes, but the class loader, if you look at, you know, all those hex digits at the end, uh, they're using two different class loaders. Second thing is multi-methods. You know, multi-methods allow you to do arbitrary dispatch on, on anything you want. I mean, over here we're doing it on whether or not the argument is even, but you could do it by phase of the moon if you wanted. So we define our methods for this multi-method. We can see that, yes, it works. But with multi-methods, one of the neat things is that you can actually you know, change their implementation. You can actually kind of remove a method, and then we see that, oh, well, now we, we, we no longer <coughs> know how to handle that. So multi-methods are a great feature, and they add to the dynamic ability by being able to kind of at runtime change uh, what that method will do depending on the argument. Uh, protocols are another feature that are very similar. They're a little bit higher performance. They can do um, you know, kind of the dispatch based on the type, which is more efficient than having to do this dispatch function. So we can create a protocol. We create an implementation of that protocol. We call it, and one of the neat things about protocols is then we can extend you know, types that we have absolutely no control over. So like java.line.string, you know, it can extend this protocol, and we can call it and see you know, a, a specific uh, implementation for java.line.string. So this you know, allows you to, again, extend your runtime and do new things with it. One difference between this and multi-methods is that there's no way to remove those mappings. So once you've defined it, you're, you're kind of stuck with it. So in conclusion, you know, VARs and namespaces are, are awesome. I mean, they really allow you to do this dynamic REPL-driven development. And every time that I'm developing in a, in a language that doesn't have this, I miss it. And, but you know, they're features that don't come free. I mean, there, there is a cost. And the biggest cost really is that startup time cost. And it's really the thing that keeps me, for example, wholeheartedly recommending Clojure for Android development. You know, that big startup time is a big issue for mobile apps. But the good news is, is that there's a lot of people who are interested in solving this problem and looking at ways to either tweak the runtime or just create a whole new runtime that, that, that solves this problem, at least for a production application. 
And the last thing, and my favorite thing, is, is that you know, we're functional primers. We're all about, yay, persistent data structures, yay, mutability. But at the very heart of closure, we have this nice mass of global mutable state that allows us to be able to do all the things that we want with, uh, with our REPL.